Hi. So uh, I've been introduced. I won't go uh, into too much detail ab about my background except to say that my primary area of research emphasis is the ethics of emerging technologies. I teach at Santa Clara University, which is in Silicon Valley, and I have had many opportunities to talk with people in the industry, uh, particularly in the software industry, in Silicon Valley about ethics. And it's always an interesting conversation, and I hope that at least we can have uh, at least a little bit of an interesting conversation here. So I'm gonna begin by uh, talking about the future, but it's difficult to know what to say about the future. Part of the point uh, that I make in an upcoming book, uh, which I'll talk a little bit about today, is that uh, the way that technologies have become embedded in our institutions globally, nationally, locally, and our individual ways of going about our lives have made uh, the future so difficult to fathom that this presents a fundamental challenge for ethics. Ethics is largely about the good life. It requires some expectation of being able to foresee how our lives might go. But technologies are increasingly dynamic, fast moving, unpredictable, interacting with other complex adaptive systems in ways that are simply incalculable uh, for any effort to develop firm predictions. So what does that mean for ethics? So the future is hard to get a grasp on. We find it difficult to know where technology is taking us today or perhaps I should say where we are going with technology because technology doesn't take us anywhere without us making certain choices, decisions, um, applying certain values to our design choices, to our implementation, uh, to our marketing strategies, to our regulatory policies. So where are we going with technology? Where do we want to go? Why is this question so hard to answer? And why do we need an answer? Maybe we should just take our hands off the wheel and say, all right, let's just see where we go. Well, there's a reason to think we probably do need an answer, or at least something in the shape of an answer. And it has to do uh, with something uh, that is commonly called the great filter. And I want to suggest that there might be more than one. The great filter uh, is, a, is a concept that refers to something known as the Fermi paradox. How many here had some familiarity with this? Okay, so. The Fermi paradox is basically a question about why, if the universe is as well suited for planets with uh, habitable intelligent civilizations as astronomers tell us it is, and if the universe is as old as uh, cosmologists tell us it is, mathematically, uh, there should be a lot of intelligent civilizations traveling the galaxy, making contact with civilizations like ours. And yet, when we look, when we listen so far, we hear nothing. So the Fermi paradox is, where are they? Mathematics, astronomy, cosmology tells us that we should not be the only ones, and yet the universe seems very, very quiet. One hypothesis for where everyone is has to do with the great filter, the idea that there's some variable we haven't considered that interrupts the development of intelligent civilizations, prevents them from spreading uh, signals beyond their own uh, planet, or prevents intelligent life in most circumstances from developing very far at all. So here's some possible great filters. Global environmental and ecological instability. It is possible that once a society becomes sufficiently technologically advanced, it tends to destroy its own environment such that it can no longer flourish or even survive. And this is what we call existential risk, fundamental risks to human survival or flourishing. There's also been a lot of talk recently about the uncertain social risks of artificial intelligence and automation trying to understand what the development of these technologies means for the human family in the long term. There's been uh, some discussion, perhaps maybe uh, there needs to be more, about the fragility of a globally networked world that we still do not know how to keep secure, and the dangers of having infrastructure embedded in network systems that are vulnerable 
uh, and fragile, and the way that that could ultimately impact human flourishing on a broad scale is something that we're still working through. We could talk about biotech and the risk of engineered pathogens that could have devastating effects on the potential of the human race to flourish and survive. And of course, we can also talk about lethal military robots, the new face of war, and the ongoing risks of nuclear and other kinds of species level devastation. So these are just some of the great filters that we might be facing that might prevent us from flourishing and our children from flourishing. So given this unprecedented condition of what I call techno-social opacity, the inability to see very far forward about how technology and society are going to be shaped by the choices that we're making today. In this condition, how can humans continue to do ethics in any serious and useful way? Ethics is about figuring out what it means to live well, what it means to flourish, and what, how we can allow that to be more likely as a result of the choices and the habits that we form today. But that planning, that calculus, is no longer easy to do. In my book, I present one way of thinking about a possible, not a solution, but a mitigation of this problem. And it has to do with a system of ethical thinking that's very, very old from the classical world, classical Greek, Confucian, and Buddhist accounts of ethics seen through the lens of virtue, seen through practices of moral self-cultivation, and particularly the cultivation of something called practical wisdom. I don't have a lot of time to talk about that here, but the essence is that these are ethical theories that are particularly well-suited for unstable, unpredictable, rapidly changing circumstances. These are ways of moral living that do not rely on fixed rules or principles that are supposed to apply universally in all conditions. They rely on the fluid and skillful judgment and perception of individuals and their ability to navigate challenging circumstances. So is it possible that we might have something uh, we might develop something like a, what I call a techno-moral virtue ethic, a contemporary practical wisdom for living well with emerging technologies. And if we could cultivate something like this, and if that could help us manage our present condition more effectively, what would that look like? So the basic claim, the basic fundamental claim of the book that I am finally finished with is this. If humanity is to have any real hope of passing safely beyond whatever great filters lie in front of us, ch a chance of not only surviving but really flourishing in the 21st century and beyond, then we are going to need more than just better technologies. We're going to need those too, but that's not enough. We're also going to need better humans, but not just any kind of good human. The kind of good human that has precisely those skills those reasoning abilities and those character traits that will suit us in our present techno-social condition. We need persons with the moral capacity, skills, and virtues to manage techno-social power wisely and well. And I suggest that we right now don't have that. And we could cite many, many examples in support of that claim. So how could we get it? So what would these virtues be? What would a set of virtues for the 21st century and beyond look like. I'm just going to run through them relatively quickly. I named 12. It's arbitrary. I could have named 15. I could have named 10. But let's talk about these. There's something called a vir the virtue of honesty. But what would techno-moral honesty look like? It would be a reliable disposition to expect res express respect for truth in techno-social contexts, especially in new information practices. And this is something humans haven't yet figured out how to do, how to be honest in a world where information is mediated primarily through technology. Self-control, technomoral self-control, an ability to choose and desire for their own sakes those technosocial goods and experiences that contribute most to human flourishing. And this is essential in a world where manipulation of desire and addiction by design are widespread technological and marketing practices. Technomoral humility, this is a big one. This is a recognition of the limits of technosocial knowledge and ability. 
its respect for the universe's res retained power to surprise and confound us. Renunciation of blind faith in the human capacity for technical mastery and control of our world. And this is essential for dealing with complex systems that resist human inspection or accurate prediction. For example, machine learning algorithms, ecosystems, economies. These all behave in unpredictable ways that resist human mastery. And the sooner we learn to cope with that limitation and manage it better, the better off we will be. Technomoral justice a reliable disposition to seek a fair distribution of the benefits and risks of new technologies, and a steady concern for how emerging technologies may impact the basic rights, dignity, or welfare of individuals and groups. And this is essential in a world with great disparities in techno-scientific knowledge, wealth, and power. Technomoral courage, a reliable disposition toward intelligent fear and hope with respect to the moral and material dangers and opportunities presented by emerging technologies. So technomoral courage would straddle the line, it would, as virtue ethicists say, strike the mean between techno-optimism, blind faith in the power of technology to do everything good and only good things, and techno-pessimism, the view that technology is ultimately uh, responsible for all of the evils in the world. So technomoral courage, then, is essential for responsible and prudent assessment of technosocial risk and promise. Technomoral empathy, a cultivated openness to being morally moved to caring action by the plight of other members of our technosocial world, essential for combating moral apathy, passivity, and abuses of technosocial power. Related to that, the virtue of technomoral care, a skillful, attentive, responsive disposition to personally meet the needs of those with whom we share our technosocial environments. Essential for a world, for example, in which ICTs and robotics increasingly mediate our natural caring relations, such as parenting and friendship. Technomoral civility, a sincere disposition to live well with other citizens of a globally networked information society, to collectively and wisely deliberate about technosocial action and policy, and to work cooperatively cooperatively towards those goods of technosocial life that we seek and expect to share with others. Technomoral flexibility, a reliable and skillful disposition to modulate action, belief, feeling, as called for by novel, unpredictable, and unstable technosocial conditions. This is an essential virtue for coping with what I've called our acute technosocial opacity and our increasingly rapid pace of technosocial change. Technomoral perspective, a reliable disposition to attend to and grasp technosocial events as meaningful parts of a moral whole, to not get lost in the details, to be able to stand back and understand how our lives are going on the whole as not just ourselves, not just our families, not just our nation, but as the human family. And this is essential for holding in view technomoral concerns that are global in scope and that unfold over many generations. This is a critical factor in assessing technosocial risk and weighing technosocial trade-offs. Technomoral magnanimity, a reliable disposition towards technomoral leadership and nobility of purpose that transcends petty, parochial, and temporary interests. And I would argue that this might be where we are needing help the most today. And finally, technomoral wisdom, which is uh, my version of practical wisdom, the same kind of practical wisdom that the classical philosophers talked about, but adapted for contemporary needs and concerns. It's a general condition of well-cultivated and integrated technomoral expertise, bringing together all of those other virtues and applying them in ways that embody those virtues of character and that allow us individually and collectively to live well with emerging technologies. I want to wrap up with a quote uh, from a 20th century philosopher, Jose Ortega y Gasset, Spanish philosopher, who wrote an essay uh, translated uh, as Man the Technician. He says, technology is, strictly speaking, not the beginning of things. It will mobilize its ingenuity and perform the task life is. It will, within certain limits, of course, succeed in realizing the human project. But technology does not draw up that project. 
the final aims technology has to pursue come from elsewhere. Those final aims come from us, from thinking about the lives that we want, the lives that we should want, the lives that we want our children to have. And that's what my book is about, about becoming the sort of people who are capable of having a vision of those final aims. Thank you. And the inevitable plug, my book uh, will be out in the spring from Oxford University Press. Uh, the title is 21st Century Virtue, Technology and the Future of Human Flourishing. <laughs>